Yeah, I will start off by talking about uh, how IDC defines the edge and how we, we see this whole shift towards the edge uh, in a broader context. Uh, I'll then also talk about how uh, organizations in the Benelux and Nordic region are uh, adopting uh, edge. And uh, then I will hand over to, to Keith, who will talk more about how SUSE sees it uh, and some of the specific use cases, and maybe even give you some advice of how to to uh, address these uh, challenges and the opportunities that, uh, that you see. So, um, with that, uh, edge computing in Benelux and the Nordics, and I do apologize, I know this is not a very Nordic nor Benelux um, picture, but um, that's that's how it is. Uh, it is a edge and then overlooking some city with some business opportunities. Uh, so what do we actually see in, in this? Um, I guess you have all, uh, and I, one thing actually, uh, the first two slides I also presented last week. Uh, I know some of you on the call uh, today um, joined that, but we also have some, some new people. So I will uh, go through the first two slides quickly. Um, the rest of the, the presentation is, uh, is different. So, um, so please, even though you saw the first two slides, uh, stick around for, for that. Um, what we see, of course, is that all organizations, more or less, are on this uh, journey to, to digitize, to digitally transform the business and have loads and loads of data on that. Uh, and that, of course, also requires some uh, IT modernization. And we have a lot of data on, uh, on that as well. Uh, but uh, rather than uh, reiterating that, I would just like to highlight one of the uh, predictions that IDC recently did on uh, uh, specifically for, for what we call the CIO agenda predictions. Uh, and that is that about 40% of CIOs, they will actually fail in delivering the infrastructure that is needed for, for the business. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, it can be organizational, it can be um, uh, lack of skills, uh, or skills shortage. Uh, it can be a lot of different elements really, uh, but it's also really about building the, the proper infrastructure and making the uh, services available to the business. Uh, and in order to, to um, uh, try to avoid to be among those 40%, uh, it's very important to build what we call a future digital infrastructure. Um, it's uh, very much about autonomous operations uh, with the business, um, uh, setting new requirements, uh, uh, having a requirement for a lot of agility, a lot of speed. Uh, organizations need to embrace uh, autonomous technologies to be able to, to deploy quickly, to automate, uh, to uh, update. Uh, and um, and so on, and not spend time on too much time at least on patching, updating, and what have you. Um, so that's an, an overarching thing. And then last week we talked about the the cloud native technologies, so the microservices, the IP centric IP, IPA um, API, sorry, uh, centricity, um, the uh, containers, the Kubernetes, uh, and what have you. We talked about that uh, last week. And the other element is what we call uh, ubiquitous deployment. And what that's really about is to have an optimal deployment strategy. Uh, we've several times talked about whether it's cloud or uh, non-cloud, or if it's public cloud or private cloud, uh, but just a little more um, aspects to that. Uh, depending on the, the use case, it may make more sense to, uh, to have a CAPEX approach to it. So buy the assets and the infrastructure or the whatever you need to provide the actual service, or you may use it uh, by it as a service. Um, we also have the asset users as dedicated resources or shared resources, whether they sit in the, you know, it could be dedicated in a public cloud environment as well. Um, but, but what is it actually? And that really depends on the type of uh, service that, uh, that delivered, the type of data, uh, the, uh, if there's a lot of fluctuations in the, uh, in the capacity, uh, a lot of different peaks and uh, in the, um, in, uh, in the, the workflows, then it may make sense to have at least some shared services uh, and have, uh, have it as a service. Uh, whereas if it's uh, highly confidential data, it may make more sense to have it on a dedicated environment and maybe having it at a key base. Uh, but those are, are some issues, of course, about that and that you need to, to address. Uh, but you also have the thing about where you actually deploy it. Is it at the core? And that can be in your own private uh, data center uh, or it can be in a public cloud that is still considered the core or do you, um, position the, uh, the compute and the storage and the what have you at the edge. Um, and when we talk about edge, that really is a lot of different things. Um, we have what we call, or IDC calls the enterprise edge. And that's really just a, that's about making traditional IT resources available to the enterprise or to users. 
Um, and uh, what differentiates that from the traditional secondary data center that you could build is that it's much more automated. It's uh, remotely managed, so there's no need to really um, manage it to the same, same extent as you do with a traditional secondary data center. We also have the industrial edge, and that's really about um, uh, what, what, where we have the IT, OT convergence. So it's about manufacturing and other businesses as well, where you build an edge that kind of, um, of integrates the IT environment with the operational technology environment uh, to make it more, uh, to automate it, to give more insights and all those different elements that we talk about there. Uh, and those uh, two different edge types are very often connected directly to a call um, through dedicated lines or whatever uh, in, in that area. And then we also have uh, what we call a tactical edge, which is very often uh, more about the, it's about the, um, uh, it can be about the public uh, infrastructures. Uh, it can be about um, medical uh, use cases uh, that really transfers through a telco edge, if you want to call it that. Uh, so some kind of wireless connections, uh, typically cellular. Uh, into the, the core, and you also have the device edge, which is everything else, really. It can be uh, trucks, it can be uh, drones, it can be uh, whatever kind of device you have out there. And when we talk about this device edge, we also have, uh, and also the tactical for that matter, we also have the, the heavy versus the, the light edge, uh, and that's really about to what extent it uses more traditional infrastructure or uh, use more, um, more different, more uh, thin infrastructure, even to the extent that the that uh, a lot of the functionality is embedded in the specific devices. Uh, and we'll get back to that in, uh, later in, in the call. So uh, we say that uh, the infrastructure spending shifts towards that, so that it's becoming more and more important. Uh, and uh, this is a, from a survey, so it's not just a, some data that IDC has, has made up uh, or uh, our own forecast that I want to, to document with this. Uh, we see that, six, that um, on average, um, IT um, responsible say that 18% of the infrastructure spending um, in 2020 uh, was on edge solutions. Um, and that is by itself, I think, a, a quite high number considering how little uh, or how new the, uh, the edge technology really is. Um, but also uh, when we compare it with our previous surveys, we've seen a tremendous growth in that. We've seen actually a coupling uh, from about eight, nine percent uh, two years back uh, to, to the 18% now. Uh, the other shift that we see here is that uh, more and more goes into cloud and both enterprise data centers and secondary data centers are really um, making up for a smaller part of the infrastructure spending uh, as, as we see it. And if we then look at what it actually is that organizations want to achieve uh, by moving something to the cloud, uh, we actually see that only about 20, 25%, they actually use edge solutions in production environments. Uh, it's still very much about exploration and uh, about testing and piloting things, uh, but it's really about uh, improving the business. Uh, and that is, can be both productivity, um, security and compliance, I'll get back to some of these uh, later on, decision making. So that's, as, as I said, for instance, on the, on the um, uh, towards the uh, manufacturing industry, it's about giving more insights into the operational technology data, uh, being able to analyze that, and then being able to make more better decision, faster decision, giving the end user a better uh, experience. So all of these aspects that really are core for the business to, uh, to focus on in a core part of the, uh, what we can call the, the digital journey is also what we talk about when we talk about the, the edge. And um, if we look at why uh, organizations are, are shifting towards the edge, uh, then we really need to look at, there are some actual differences between the core environments and the edge environments. Uh, the core is very much about uh, performance, scalability, uh, and we have the traditional uh, you know, technology stack with storage and the server and network and what have you, uh, even though there may be some, or typically are some abstraction layer between the software layer and the applications and the, the hardware, that's typically how it's physically built. Uh, at the edge, it's much more focused on the specific use case, the specific workload that that is efficient. Uh, we increasingly see uh, integrated stacks. It may be uh, hyper-converged infrastructure, but it can also be much smaller, uh, single board computers and what have you that uh, that's in the, that. Um, at the edge, we also see a variation uh, or a varied setup for uh, for the connectivity, uh, cellular, Wi-Fi, uh, um, uh, low power, um, uh, wireless as well. So we see a lot of different technologies in, in that, uh, whereas it's much more stable, wired and so forth at the core. Uh, we also, uh, and that's one of the reasons also mentioned the enterprise edge in the beginning, we see that it's 
the, the traditional data center has people on site. It has disaster recovery, redundancy. At the edge, that's typically not the case. There may not be people with IT skills. Uh, and sometimes, quite often, actually, uh, a failure means that the service stops uh, because there's not, not the same type of uh, fallover uh, there. And then we have the physical environment, which is really about, uh, we have the, the data center that's very managed and controlled and secure. Uh, and then at the edge, we see there are fluctuations in the temperature, there's dust, uh, physical security may be a challenge. Uh, and we see the power may not be as, uh, as stable as we see in data centers. And that also, of course, brings in some, uh, some challenges for, for organizations to, to deal with that. And the most prevalent one really is about the, uh, the, the training and education. Uh, so making sure that the skills are in place, uh, making sure that they understand, uh, that the users understand what they can do with the edge is really one of the, uh, the core elements here. It's also about bandwidth, uh, and that is both from the edge to the core and from the endpoint to the edge. So it can be in, in different um, lo locations or parts of that. Uh, and then it's about integrating it with the business. You know, if you start changing a lot of things at the, at the edge, getting your data, that needs to be integrated, and that is challenging. Uh, and then we have the security and manageability of the end device, which is another challenge. Uh, so a lot of challenges, both from communications, IT, and, and business point of view. Uh, and I'll get into sort of these in a little bit uh, more detail now. Uh, because when we actually see what the, the exact use cases for Edge are, uh, very often we talk about the latency. Uh, and uh, we use a, uh, an example with the, the Mars rover uh, that uh, it, there's a latency on 20 minutes uh, in the connectivity to, to that. So, of course, you can't remote control it. So you need to have some kind of compute uh, and autonomous uh, operations for, for a device like that. Um, and that's true, uh, it, and it clearly you know, states the challenge uh, with latency, but it's also very difficult for, I guess, for, for most of us really to, to relate to that use case. I don't think you have, there's many of you that have uh, uh, things on Mars or plan to, to do that. Uh, and we actually see that it's not just the latency. We see that as the foremost, fourth most prevalent uh, reason uh, to, uh, to put things at the edge. Um, it really is most commonly about the connectivity, so it may be the uh, complete lack of uh, connectivity uh, that the, the devices uh, at the edge are not connected to, to anything. Uh, so you need to have something uh, or it may just be that the bandwidth isn't big enough. You can't uh, or the connection isn't stable uh, so that you can't really transfer the data uh, to the to the core uh, in, in any meaningful way and analyze it and what have you, even though it's not the latency per se. That's the problem. It's the, the bandwidth instead. Well, to talk about the, the data intensity, and that's really about having too much data at the edge uh, to make sense to, to send it somewhere else uh, or just to, to make understand how to, to analyze it. So it's really about um, needing to look at very specific data points, do uh, analysis at the, um, at the edge as well uh, to really make sure that the, the use case functions. Uh, as I said on, on the previous slide, it's much more focused on the specific workload and the specific use case. Cost is another thing. Sending large amounts of data uh, across any network uh, has a, a cost to it. Uh, and security and compliance as well. Uh, if it's data, if there's any kind of sense, uh, census of data that you capture at the edge, then you know, there might, it might be easier from a security point of view, compliance point of view, to keep it at the edge rather than sending it across uh, to, to a uh, core location. So a lot of different reasons for this really. And we, uh, IDC has uh, sized, I think it's 60 something uh, use cases uh, specifically for Edge. And we see that the top 15 that I've listed here, they only make up for about 30% of the total Edge spending. So there's a lot of uh, different use cases, very um, different use cases. We see here the largest one being manufacturing operations as already alluded to, uh, production assets management, uh, omni-channel, smart grid distribution, all of these different, I'll not go through them, but all of these different uh, kind of use cases. So. Um, very, very specific. It's not generic uh, that you put something at the edge and it works. Um, and also uh, important to say that uh, each of these use cases are very different. Um, uh, this one uh, is, just shows that uh, the dark blue, uh, the further the line is towards the, uh, the labels, um, the more it is dependent on what we call um, light edge uh, spending, whereas those that are closer to the middle here, uh, are focused more on the uh, on the um, heavy edge, uh, so the more traditional infrastructure. Uh, so we see, for instance, smart buildings is much more lighter, whereas, uh, for instance, on uh, on uh, things like uh, the uh, production assets management, manufacturing operations, those are more traditional infrastructures being built, so more heavy uh, edge there. 
Uh, we also see the dependency on uh, on connectivity, uh, so the connectivity spending compared to the overall um, uh, spending of the uh, of the uh, edge um, uh, solution. Uh, and we see things like uh, in-store marketing, uh, remote health. Uh, they are much more uh, focused on uh, on or much more dependent on the connectivity uh, is a larger share than, for instance, again on the uh, break monitoring or whatever. And then finally, we have the analysis, how important is analysis to some, some uh, use cases. It's basically about collecting data and that's it. Uh, uh, very, you know, very um, to, to optimize, to automate things is very much just, does this happen, then do that. Uh, whereas uh, other use cases are much more dependent on real uh, analytics to uh, provide predictive maintenance or whatever it is that, uh, that you want to achieve. So a lot of different use cases and they all need to, to really be be built differently uh, in that matter. Uh, to circle back to my initial thing about the, the future uh, infrastructure, um, about we both have the cloud native and the, um, and the deployment um, parts of it. And uh, what we see here is that 95% uh, of the organizations that use uh, edge or the built edge solutions, they also use cloud native technologies. So it's not, so it's very integrated that you do uh, both uh, parts of this. Um, and with that, I would actually hand over to, to Keith uh, to talk more about the use of cloud native, specifically on, um, on uh, Kubernetes at the edge. Anders, thank you very much. Um, let me uh, start sharing my screen and I'll walk through uh, some really cool edge use cases and background here. Uh, one second. Okay, we should be tracking well here. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Basil. I am Vice President of Product for Cloud Native Infrastructure at SUSE. I am helping shape SUSE's edge offering and the strategy for uh, that, op um, that offering. So today I'm gonna run through uh, SUSE Edge uh, and speak to the cloud native aspects of that solution. Now I wanna start out by covering uh, just one thing. Uh, I know we had a previous webinar about Rancher, so we'll not go into detail here, um, but I do wanna uh, have you take away from this slide that what we're seeing is that Kubernetes as an upstream project, as an upstream set of APIs is really the standard that we're seeing being deployed at the edge, right? And so Rancher's capability, the SUSE Rancher capability with the product is to manage these standardized Kubernetes clusters, no matter where they are. So that's the main takeaway because it's important to set that baseline because what we're going to do is we're going to reuse those capabilities, reuse and lean on that standard to affect our edge architectures and our edge deployment and the edge stack, uh, if you will. So I uh, just wanted to call that out to make sure that there was a connection between the previous webinar and what we're talking about here at the edge. So with that, we'll jump right into the edge strategy. So. The main uh, challenge that we see with Edge is one of scale. Um, we did a survey internally of the Edge opportunities and the numbers are very interesting. So opportunities that come to us on the low end, maybe hundreds of locations under management. And there's quite a bit of diversity in those, uh, those numbers in those locations, all the way up to tens of thousands of remote clusters under management, right? So our customers and partners are looking for uh, supported guidance around uh, these edge solutions because I want to say that this entire uh, you know idea or philosophy of pushing cloud native to the edge is very new. It's new for everybody, uh, you know, including the vendors, including the customers, and so it's going to take all of us to build uh, this communal knowledge on uh, best practices and how to support the edge. And so this is one of our first steps into that to help people come to um, realize and deploy uh, best practices in this space. What we're also seeing is that um, security is critical and it's important because what we're doing is we're taking resources, both compute and storage from the traditional data center, which has hardened perimeters, firewalls, man traps, physical barriers, you know, things that we can touch and feel, right? So our compute and storage resources are protected by, behind these walls. And now we're actually pushing that into edge locations, which, which really represent very hostile environments, right? So we have a handful of retail opportunities and customers where uh, you have smaller machines, 
um, very exposed to, you know, the environment of the restaurant, uh, to the workers in that restaurant. And so the attack vectors are very different at the edge than what they would be inside the data center. And so we need to make sure that we account for those new attack vectors, that we can push our modified security policy to those locations to, so that we can um, have a, a certain level of trust that our security is very strong at the edge. So we're very big on security in, in that regard. Um, so what SUSE is working on and, and we're, this management at scale challenge is, I'm telling you, it's the biggest thing. And so we are working to build uh, a fully open sourced solution that will, will address this challenge. And if you go into a little bit more detail, I, I love this quote from one of our customers. Um, this person said that anything below Kubernetes is overhead for us, right? And so as a product manager, I, I read between the lines and I took that statement to mean that um, we as a company, as an infrastructure's provider, we need to make sure that everything below Kubernetes is automated, is made easy, is proven, is enterprise grade, is secure because the real business value at the edge is the containerized application that is deployed at the edge. And this is what the customer wants to focus on. They want to focus on the application. And by focusing on the application, that's the best for the business. But they can only do that if we can remove the complexity of Kubernetes at the edge. So you've got two things influencing that complexity. You've got Kubernetes, number one, is, is a fairly uh, complex piece of infrastructure. And then when you multiply Kubernetes by, let's say, 6,000 locations, it could be a challenge, right? And so the main driver for us is to make sure that our open source tooling and our solutions remove that complexity underneath Kubernetes. And so there's a few things we can do to do that. Um, number one, we have um, made Kubernetes easy in the form of our K3S offering. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. So we made the Kubernetes layer pretty easy. We also have a edge focused operating system that's lightweight, that's container optimized. Uh, so that's great. And then we have things like Fleet to give us the management at scale capability. And so we want to package all of that uh, in a nice, easy to consume, easy to adopt, easy to deploy uh, manner and, uh, you know, check the box for that, that customer value. So let's go into um, what the edge looks like before we go a little bit further, because I think this is a great um, defining framework so that we can have intelligent conversations around the edge. And what we're seeing based on the opportunities that come to us are really three segments of the edge. Anders talked about, you know, what the edge looks like uh, from the IDC perspective. I'm gonna talk about this from the, the SUSE perspective. And, and I think this is gonna be, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, illuminating here in, in a bit. So if you can imagine um, off the screen to the left, um, the centralized services, the big data centers, the regional data centers, all of the centralized services are at the left. That's the core, right? And so as you go from the core to the edge, you go from left to right. And the first segment that you run into is what we call the near edge. And so the near edge is mainly the realm of the communications service providers. So your big telecommunications companies, um, here in the U.S., we have what's called MSOs, multi-service operators. These are companies that provide uh, voice, video, and data, for example, the multiple services. Uh, your cable company is a, is a great example of, of a, a multi-service operator. So again, um, the communications providers live in that space. They have the infrastructure. They own and operate the infrastructure. The green box there on, under the near edge label is meant to represent a few things. One, it's the physical location for these regional data centers uh, or these regional edge locations. It also is meant to represent the network that's owned and operated by the telecommunications uh, telecom company, right? So um, the use cases there are very specific and unique to that industry. So you've got uh, the global rollout for 5G, for example, the whole packet core use cases. Um, you've got uh, private LTE and 5G. So we're seeing in some of the US government uh, use cases where um, military applications are building their own private 5G networks for connectivity in, in the battlefield, for example. And then there's this thing called MEC, multi-access edge computing, where the uh, communications providers are building Kubernetes platforms regionally so that they can invite applications and partners to run on that infrastructure to have closer access to the customers 
on the other side of the access device or on, on the other side of that line of demarcation. So lots of interesting uh, use cases there. And if you notice, uh, logically, the boxes there are pretty large because the clusters that are deployed are classic data center clusters. These are 2U machines racked up and they may be, you know, um, tens to hundreds of nodes per cluster, um, you know, across these regional data centers. So that's the near edge. Again, just to recap, it's largely the realm of the telecommunications providers. But before I leave that uh, segment, uh, that defining segment, the line of demarcation there is really important because there are some applications and some use cases that sit on that line of demark. And you'll have things like SASE, S-A-S-E, uh, for security services that are owned and operated by the telecommunications company. Um, and they'll, they'll have some edge application, you know, running Kubernetes inside that appliance. Um, there's also things like um, software-defined wide area uh, access network, SD-WAN, for example, where that appliance, the SD-WAN appliance, sits on that line of DMARC, but it is owned and operated by the telecommunications company. So we would classify that as a near-edge opportunity. So things get really cool, really interesting when we move from uh, near to far. The most um, diversity is within the far edge definition, right? And so let's actually talk about that. So we've outlined, you know, uh, use cases around commercial, industrial, and U.S. public sector or global public sector, actually. And the boxes there in the left hand side are varying uh, sizes. So on one extreme, you can go all the way down to a single node cluster running on a Raspberry Pi with maybe one or two containers that are purpose built for a, a fixed function. Uh, so that's an interesting use case. We see a lot of that. And if you go at the other end of the spectrum in the far edge use case, you'll see some manufacturing opportunities where they have a factory floor and they've carved out a small data center within the factory floor and they've got larger machines to support all of the applications and devices and things within the, uh, the factory there. So lots of diversity in, in that. The border here is meant to uh, also represent the location. So this could be hundreds or 10,000 locations. Um, it, it's also meant, meant to represent the network that's managed by that particular customer. And so this is what we call the far edge. And we're going to show some examples of far edge deployments um, uh, in a few slides. And then the last section here is the tiny edge, right? And so if you notice the tiny edge boxes on the right, represent the industrial IoT devices, right? So these are really small computing units, fixed function devices that do one thing and do one thing very well. Uh, one of the best ways to visualize this, uh, no pun intended, is an IP camera, right? So these would be devices, if you notice, they're still within that location, the hard border, they're still within the same uh, network uh, space as the cluster. And so we need to have uh, access to these, vice, the, these devices. And so one of the best ways to, to get access to those devices is to install um, a, a piece of software on the local Kubernetes cluster that can discover those devices, that can speak the protocol that those devices speak and get command and control over those devices to pull data from them, to upgrade them, um, to manage the life cycle of that device. So there's an interesting project called Akri, A-K-R-I by Microsoft. And we're participating with Microsoft Upstream in that project to make um, coverage for those industrial IoT devices uh, really strong uh, and available to customers uh, in, you know, who have tiny edge uh, use cases. So just to recap, going from left to right, core services are not on the screen, they're off to the left. The first segment that you run into from a logical perspective is the near edge, the realm of the telecom, uh, telecom providers. And then you jump over the line of DMARC, you run into customer use cases, lots of diversity in the far edge. And we're gonna be talking about that in a moment. And then the tiny edge is the industrial IoT space where we need to have access and command and control over those devices. So actually let's go through and talk about what a high level uh, solution looks like in terms of architecture. So this will give you guidance in some uh, things to think about when you uh, think about building your edge solution. And so SUSE uh, has two broad areas of solution. We're gonna talk about the cloud native today since this is a, a Kubernetes webinar. Uh, but the, the takeaway from this slide is that we are ready to meet the customer wherever they are in their journey, right? So if it's a customer that has a legacy application that needs to run on bare metal, or they need virtualization to run, let's say a, a older Windows application, we have infrastructure management uh, solutions and products to fit that use case. Um, and then they may have that on one hand, but then they may be moving into cloud native 
um, opportunities with uh, modern app applications running in containers. And so we have the cloud native edge solutions, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. But the picture is is fully complete, where we can walk in and uh, not only handle and and provide solutions for what you have today, but give you that runway to move into uh, the cloud native world in, of the future. And so the the solution maps uh, similar to this. And if you notice, we keep the same um, definition or framework of near and far and tiny, right? And so we think that. Um, software stacks uh, will fit better in these use cases. It's not 100% prescriptive because you can mix and match, but uh, based on the performance requirements um, and uh, for some of these use cases, there may be a better uh, solution for each use case. So for example, in the near edge, uh, particularly with the 5G packet core, it's all about moving packets as fast as possible. And so that's a strong data center grade use case at the uh, at the near edge. And so things like SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, things like Precision Time Protocol, SRIOV, uh, DPDK, th those all make sense in that space where we're just moving packets as fast as possible to support the, the phones on the other side of, of the radio, right? So that's really strong there. And then Rancher has, um, SUSE Rancher has a, a distro offering called Rancher Kubernetes Engine 2, which is our data center grade version of Kubernetes. It's a, um, a cloud native computing foundation, CNCF certified distro. So it's fully standardized and your applications, your containers would run as normal on top of that stack. And Rancher is the management platform. Um, as we said at the top of the call, the main challenge is management at scale and Rancher has really uh, some unique features that bring uh, management at scale features to the table. So that's the near edge. Things get really interesting, again, always on the far edge where we have uh, at the bottom uh, of the stack, a operating system option that is designed for, you know, resource constrained environments, because here you have to be flexible enough to go from that Raspberry Pi to almost a data center grade um, Kubernetes cluster deployed at the far edge, depending on what the customer wants depending on what you want um, and depending on what the application requires, right? And so Sleep Micro uh, from SUSE is a really strong um, option for meeting the diversity of those use cases because it's uh, it runs on x86 and it also runs on ARM. Uh, so we've checked the box strongly in that, in that regard. And then moving up the stack, you have uh, K3S, which is a lightweight Kubernetes that is very similar in philosophy to Sleep Micro. It runs on ARM, it runs on Intel, it's a single binary and it has zero dependencies on the Linux operating system. So literally one command, you run that and 45 seconds later, you've got a CNCF certified distribution of Kubernetes at the edge. Um, and you can run that on a single node cluster and it's, it's a beautiful piece of software. Because it's CNCF certified, the containers will run on that as normal. It's Kubernetes. Again, Kubernetes is the standard across uh, all of the cloud native things that we're doing. And we're seeing it being adopted across the edge infrastructure as well. And so your workloads would just run on that. And because it's a standard, Rancher, the management platform can see that, can manage the downstream cluster, again, from you know one or two downstream clusters to tens of thousands of downstream clusters. Now we've called out um, the uh, tiny edge as future, because as I said earlier, we're working with Microsoft upstream with Ocri. And so our mission there is to further mat the maturation of the protocol coverage so that we can uh, address um, various devices out there uh, based on the protocol that they speak. And so once that gets more mature, that will be fully productized, but it is absolutely the best way to go because it, it basically brings the siloed nat uh, nature of the industrial IoT protocol space into a cloud native world, right? So no matter what the protocol is, as long as we have a plugin that can speak to that protocol, we can then plug those streams, um, the data, the command and control into the container and, and we can uh, have the application manage that device at the edge. So what does this look like uh, from a, a deployment perspective? So I'm gonna continue with the high level architecture. And so if you look on the right, this is uh, a stack that will be deployed at the edge. So there's some interesting things happening here. So you have some hardware at the bottom, which is the black box. You have you know, a, a SUSE Linux enterprise uh, based operating system running on that. It could be uh, a different operating system um, as far as you know, the Rancher uh, Kubernetes distro is concerned, but we, we prefer the, the SLE one because we, you'll see why in a second, we, we can have uh, command and control over that. We can manage the lifecycle. So 
We can run uh, Rancher Kubernetes Engine 2. We can run K3S there, depending on the size of the hardware, the footprint, or the use case, or the segment of the edge. And then we have a management agent that speaks back to a uh, rancher that basically phones home and says, hey, do you have something for me to do? Uh, and then your applications would run, your containerized applications would run on that stack as normal. So that's pretty much the standard stack. But what's really cool is uh, the things that we're introducing on the left-hand side. So um, in the tomorrow layer there, which is really today, um, based on some things we're, we are uh, working on and releasing with some customers, we have this new capability called the system update controller. And there's also a uh, system registration and so what this does is we can now fingerprint the hardware using uh, what's called a trusted uh, platform module. It's a trusted computing module. And that gives us a unique hash for that particular node. So now we can, we can identify that machine uniquely against the tens of thousands of others out there. And then once we have that unique identif identification associated with Rancher, we can then send down new versions of the operating system, new versions of the K3S, new versions of the app. So we are effectively using the Kubernetes API, the standard that I talked about earlier to manage the entire lifecycle of that stack going all the way down to the operating system. So if there's a new kernel that, that happens or a new uh, set of CVEs that we need to patch the operating system, we can take the cloud native best practices in the form of, let's say GitOps, we can build a new operating system on the left-hand side of the equation as part of our build process. Once we get the new image, we can then uh, have Rancher manage the deployment of that image across thousands of locations using the system update controller and the management agent that's running on that cluster. It's very powerful software, and uh, we're, we're very proud to open source all of this and make it available to the world to use. So this is a, a little bit more of a technical deep dive into the architecture, but um, this is what removes the complexity of, of Kubernetes, right? Because we've automated this entire process so that the customer can just focus on deploying the application or just updating the operating system once and then have it cascade down through the footprint of the deployment. And so what does this look like from a very high level vision in summary? Um, you know, we wanna provide the full stack lifecycle management. We're very well on our way to do that. Um, you know, dashboard driven uh, user experience, um, you know, support for hundreds to tens of thousands of clusters, as I said. Security is critical. Uh, again, we're moving from the data center to a very hostile environment. So trust is going to be paramount. We need to trust the fact that if we've shipped a machine to a location, we need to know that that machine has not been tampered with in transit. And we also need to know that that machine has not been tampered with um, uh, in position, right, in situ. So um, if somebody you know adds a USB stick to that machine, we need to know that that hardware profile has changed and that we should not trust that machine uh, and we should you know, flag an alert to do something about that, right? So the trust management is critical for the edge uh, deployments. So onboarding these devices is part of the, uh, that process and having that automated deployment, uh, the operating system management, the upgrades, the updates, the rollbacks as, as we see, um, that's all about removing uh, the overhead of the complexity of Kubernetes underneath, uh, everything underneath Kubernetes, right? And so. We have uh, that capability in the form of Sleep Micro. Hardware management, we talk about device onboarding, but we wanna be able to say yes to multiple architectures. So this is why um, Sleep Micro and K3S are really strong solutions um, because if a customer says, hey, I wanna run on ARM, we have a solution. If I wanna run on Intel, we have a solution. If there's FPGA support or GPU support, we can talk about those solutions going forward as well. And then because all of this is new, we're very, in a very early, a stage of the adoption lifecycle, we need to have a lot of docs, we need to have reference architectures, we need to have best practices, and we need to freely share those with our customers so that people can come up to speed very fast with uh, their edge deployments. And so um, I've got a few more slides here to talk about some real world use cases that are really interesting. So let's actually uh, go through this. So uh, this slide is a visual slide and I wanna, um, uh, I, I put this together to show the diversity of the use cases. So in each one of these pictures, there's a cloud native edge solution in play, right? So the blue truck is a mobile data center. It's probably the best way to think about it. Inside that truck is compute resources with K3S running uh, inside the truck. And so the truck pulls up to a location, there's applications running on top of uh, the Kubernetes, the K3S deployment, and it pulls sensor data from 
uh, the oil equipment at that location, right? So really interesting use case there in, in the terms that, in the sense that it, it's mobile. The wind turbine on the left is the same situation. It's a far edge use case. The wind turbine itself is the um, far edge uh, boundary. Uh, inside that, it's, it has its own network, has its own sensors. There's a Kubernetes cluster running K3S in each one of those wind turbines. And then lastly, the bottom right, um, working with the Department of Defense, uh, specifically the Air Force, um, we have uh, deployed K3S uh, in a U-2 spy plane, right? And so the plane itself represents that far edge domain, um, the edges of, no pun intended, the edges of that far edge deployment is the plane itself. There's a network inside the plane, there's a Kubernetes cluster inside the plane, and we've demonstrated upgrading software while the plane was in air using fleet um, from Rancher to manage uh, that location. So that's another mobile location. And probably the, the farthest out and the most interesting use case is one where we have Kubernetes in space. So we have a partner um, here in the, in the US uh, called Hypergiant, and they've uh, deployed K3S on satellites running on Raspberry Pi. So this is a small cluster of Raspberry Pis. It has its own network. Uh, the satellite itself is a far edge location. There are cameras and sensors inside the satellite that pull data and send that data, process the data locally within the Kubernetes cluster and send uh, the meaningful results back to uh, Mother Earth. So uh, very interesting use case. And then Airbus is doing uh, very similar work with satellites um, and you know fleets of satellites using K3S there uh, as well. And so generically, I want to speak to um, some opportunities that actually span multiple segments of edge, right? So here is a, an industrial and manufacturing um, use case where the near edge is where they deploy Rancher. Uh, it could be in the cloud. Uh, one thing about Rancher is that it is it just needs a standard uh, CNCF certified distro of Kubernetes to deploy. So you have the freedom to deploy Rancher, your management plane anywhere, which is really uh, great in terms of flexibility. But here there's a thousand uh, remote locations. So that's a thousand far edge clusters. And then they are supporting thousands of sensors in each one of those locations, right? So there's tiny edge um, devices that need to be supported on the production line for this factory use case. What's really cool about this scenario is that they're using modern software development uh, techniques in the form of CI, CD pipelines and GitOps to manage um, uh, the broad um, scope of, of this deployment. And uh, one other scenario here is a retail edge. Uh, this is a rancher management plane somewhere in the cloud. Um, and then they have a thousand locations. They also have um, cloud native storage at each one of those locations because they're doing snapshotting of the state of that restaurant and then offloading those snapshots to uh, an S3 bucket uh, that's outside of the store for backup purposes. So really interesting use case there. Shows a little bit more of the diversity. And then finally, um, we've got an asset tracking solution. Uh, so this is a smaller deployment, but there are many of these deployments, right? So this customer is actually reselling this for the manufacturing space where um, you drop in a small K3S cluster as kind of home base, and then it talks to uh, these edge sensors that uh, track the assets within the factory warehouse. And so those sensors and devices are industrial IoT devices from our perspective. So that's the tiny edge. And they start at on, this, on the low end with 50 and can go up to hundreds of these uh, IoT devices uh, for tracking. So let me just summarize and finish by uh, reviewing the three pillars of the Cloud Native Edge. So um, we think that these pillars are required, right? So to answer that question and to provide the value and to make that statement of everything below Kubernetes is overhead, to, to really bring value to that statement, these things are required. So the first is a lightweight version of Kubernetes. This is in the form of K3S, as I said earlier. It's a single binary, runs on ARM, runs on Intel. It's CNCF certified. It is standard Kubernetes, right? And, and it is probably uh, the highest adopted Kubernetes distro in the world. Uh, just to give you some data points on K3S, uh, is, uh, the traction, we are experiencing over 20,000 downloads per week, which is tracking to be over a million per year. It is the number one uh, CNCF certified distro at the edge. So. Um, that's K3S, again, uh, runs on Intel, runs on ARM. And then we need an operating system for K3S to run on. So we offer Sleep Micro, very same uh, philosophy, runs on Intel, runs on ARM, container focus, very low footprint from an attack service pers perspective, has all of the uh, trappings that you'll find in an enterprise Linux 
such as certifications that you'll see in the SLEE family so we can bring the security and the trust positioning to the edge based on uh, SLEE Micro. And then lastly, Rancher with its fleet capabilities to manage tens of thousands of locations. And that is probably the magic piece there that makes all of this work because you may have a stack, you may have it in the lab, but if you cannot deploy this and manage this at the numbers that we're seeing at the edge, you really don't have a solution. So when you add all these together, that is the requirement for an MVP, uh, the three pillars for a cloud native edge. So uh, this is my last slide and uh, I'm happy to turn it back over to Thomas uh, for Q&A and Anders um, and I'll stop sharing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith, um, for that. Oh, I would say deep dive in the architecture. You probably would say that it's a very quick overview of it. Um, but um, I think, you know, I talked about how IDC defines the edge and uh, you talked about how SUSE does it. And I don't think it's that different. Uh, we do some use some different words and but still the really how close is it to the core? Uh, what type of um, infrastructure is it that sits at the different uh, elements? Um, but I also think that maybe we are bringing some some conf you know, unneeded confusion into to the space here uh, by using different terms. Uh, so, so if you uh, are a customer or a end user of, of some sort uh, and would like to get started on an edge journey, um, how would you say that, how should they address it? Should they just say we want edge or should they look at a specific use case? And if they found that, how would they go about that? Uh, you know, uh, deploying an edge solution or setting that up uh, go afterwards? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think it all starts with the application, right? That's the first point of triage. So um, if the application is containerized, uh, understand the requirements to run that application in terms of CPU and memory, um, that will drive, for example, your selection of hardware and the size of the cluster to be deployed. And then once you, you've settled on, okay, what is the application footprint? Then you can talk about, okay, numbers, locations, stand up a PLC. Um, one of the first things that I would do is uh, go to k3s.io, download k3s, and literally 45 seconds later, you have an environment that you can test and, and deploy your application onto to do some early analysis of that footprint. Um, and once you, once you get to that level, then it's just um, kind of basic, you know, movements to go through uh, from PLC to production and just slowly increasing the scale. One of the patterns, and I'll end with this, one of the patterns that we see with our opportunities is that customers do exactly that. They start with a PLC internally, uh, they work small, and then they slowly, gradually roll it out to the bigger numbers. So a customer with 10,000 locations obviously is not going to do a 10,000 location deployment on day one. What they tend to do is start with the POC, maybe start with uh, 10 locations, 50 locations, 200, and then do a scheduled rollout over some number of years to get to that 10,000 location, for example, number. Yeah, thanks. Um, another thing I uh, thought about when you went through some of the, the use cases, um, you talked about what they did. Um, I started trying to just to look at it from a little bit more high level business point of view, what can be achieved, uh, why are organizations uh, doing this? So are, are there any of these use cases or other ones that um, where you can can uh, elevate uh, one of some of the benefits uh, to, to actual business benefits? Um, so you said everything below Kubernetes is, is, uh, is overhead. Um, and then you'd say that, but you still really need to get above the application level. Um, the, the application itself is not Business value, right? There's some. It has to be integrated to the business. Have you seen any, any, any either? You mentioned your own survey data points. Just some some examples of where you see the benefit of this. Is it cost? Is it um, agility? What's the you know, business out, outcome from uh, from some of these uh, cases? Yeah, I, I think the big themes there are cost and, ag and agility. Uh, you called it correctly with agility. So we have we have one customer uh, opportunity where their team is highly skilled, but very small. And they have to support uh, just under 8,000 locations, right? And so um, by being cloud native in their approach, it gives them the agility and leverage in the tool set to scale. So they're, they're taking that gradual approach I described earlier where they've done PLCs for some time. They're, they're very good at what they do. And now they're looking for the enterprise support to support their production rollout across all of these locations. 
And so um, the team has not grown, okay, which is the main thing. They, it's the same small number of folks, but now their scope of management is a lot greater. But by going to a cloud native approach, they can reuse their learnings. In fact, they've actually, um, uh, because they're so bought into this and they see the value from a leverage perspective, they've actually converted one of their point of sale systems from a legacy window app to a cloud native app. So all of the point of sale systems will now be a cloud native application running on the same cluster at each one of these locations. And the only thing that they've done is converted that app and then increase the number of nodes per cluster for more resiliency at the edge. Uh, but they're doing a, a marvelous job in, in uh, leveraging the tools that they have. Great, thanks. And, and I think um, that's actually a, you mentioned it a couple of times about the, uh, the skills and the, uh, and the agility and the, the work processes. So the, the entire, what you call it, DevOps uh, story. Uh, and I think that that's also, we're not going to start talking about that today, I think, uh, as we have <laughs> only a few minutes left. Uh, but, but I still think that it, it is important to, to bring that into also as a, one of the challenges I said was about integrating it to the business and so forth. So it's not just a technology journey or a technology adoption, it really is also leveraging the, the resources as the example you just um, said here um, uh, uh, on uh, on this space. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was going to, yeah, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I was going to say, um, you know, the whole uh, GitOps approach is really powerful in this use case. So that same team, they're doing a pattern that we're seeing across the board for cloud native. They're using, uh, you know, this whole GitOps philosophy where the Git repository is the source of truth, right? The source of authority for everything that's being defined or declared downstream. And so um, they're using it to push, you know, as I said in, uh, earlier, the operating system updates, the application configuration and management, the security policies are being pushed all from a central authoritative repository. And it's, it, it's, it gives them the scalability to do that tens of thousands of times with one source of truth. It's, very, it's a very powerful um, model uh, to give that leverage. Yeah, I agree. Um, just one last uh, thing here. Uh, you mentioned um, skills, um, I think, on uh, one of your slides as well. And I have education and training, which I guess, to some extent, at least, uh, transfers into to skills as well, um, as the number one or most prevalent, at least, uh, challenge regarding uh, edge. What, what is, if you should give any advice for organizations to, to stay on top or for decision makers to, to stay on top of the possibilities in edge and for making sure that the internal skill sets or possibly using external um, resources uh, for, for upskilling the, the, for the solution. Uh, what what would, would that be if you put any skills and training related um, good advice for, for organizations uh, to, to address that? Yeah, you know, um, Kubernetes has pretty much won the uh, container orchestration war, so to speak, and it is the standard. So it's an interesting thing that's happened. Uh, you know, if I could go back in time a little bit in the, infrastructure as a service world of cloud, you had competing uh, APIs, right? You had the Google API, the Amazon API set, you had OpenStack and open source uh, and you know Azure, they're all competing and you had tooling specific to each one of those. It's very different here with the Kubernetes and container world because Kubernetes is the standard. It's the same Kubernetes across Google, Azure, you know, um, Amazon and private, right? Uh, so that's a huge benefit uh, for us, and it gives our customers a tremendous amount of flexibility. Um, so if you can um, learn about Kubernetes, you know, administrating Kubernetes, deploying applications with Kubernetes, um, if you move higher up into the stack, things like understanding how to deploy applications with Helm charts, those are all skills that can be applied against any infrastructure because of that standardization. And that's probably the best um, return on investment that could take place is if you if you stay within that standardized ecosystem that is Kubernetes, then those skills can be leveraged across uh, many use cases and uh, many environments. Great, thank you. Um, unless there are any questions and I haven't seen any, uh, I think I would like to thank you all for joining and thank you Keith for being here for what is in the middle of the night for you um, and uh, giving some great insights. Um, and um, 